All right, looks like we're live. Welcome everyone. Uh, it's been a little while since we've had an Escarpment Labs uh, webinar, um, but really excited to uh, find some time to have one this summer. It's been a pretty busy summer on our end. I'm sure uh, you all have been super busy as well, but I, I really hope that as we uh, get to the end of the summer, get to back to school time, uh, we're all excited to, to learn again, especially when it comes to our favorite topic, uh, brewing yeast and fermentation. And uh, that's why I'm really excited for this talk because uh, at Escarpman, we're really committed to doing what we can to create and support new brewing and fermentation knowledge. And one of the ways we do this is through collaborations. Uh, and one collaboration that uh, we happened upon in, in the last couple of years is with, with Dr. Maitreya Dunham, uh, out of the University of Washington, whose lab um, does a lot of really, really cool stuff with yeast genomics and evolution. Um, and then when I saw that that her lab was starting to dabble with with some brewing yeast, I got really excited and um, annoying, and you know, started asking, you know, what can I send you? What are you interested in? And uh, you know, luckily they were working on this cool project about uh, how yeast evolves in the brewery. So we were able to send some samples over and. Um, work together uh, a little bit. We, we sent some yeast and contributed to the, the project that, that Maitreya is going to be talking about. So really excited. Uh, Maitreya is a professor of genome sciences at University of Washington. She grew up in rural Tennessee and trained at MIT, Stanford, and Princeton. It's quite the resume before moving to Seattle. Uh, and her lab, as I said, uses yeast as a platform to understand genome evolution and genetic variants, uh, not only in yeast, but also in humans, because yeast in humans have very similar genomes. Uh, so really excited for this one. We're going to be talking about uh, a paper that's uh, still still in in press, but you can find it on BioArchive. Uh, I'll throw the link in the comments as well. Uh, really, really cool stuff. I'm really excited about it. Well, gosh, uh, thanks a lot for the invitation and for being such a great collaborator. Um, in the green room before we went live, we came up with another thing to collaborate on. So it's always great to get to talk to you. And um, thanks for coming to my talk tonight. Um, I uh, always learn something when I give a talk for brewers. Um, you know, who cares more about yeast than a yeast geneticist and a bunch of professional yeast wranglers, right? So um, uh, I've told Richard to please interrupt me if there are questions throughout the talk. So if, if anything's unclear and you want clarifications, um, feel free to, to interrupt and, and let me know. Um, so uh, yeah, so today I'm going to talk about uh, mutant beer and um, what we have been able to understand about yeast evolution by following that evolution in real time in real breweries. Um, so, you know, mutants, I, I make the joke about mutant beer, right? But mutants really are kind of a foundation of civilization, right? Like all these different domesticated organisms are modified versions of existing wild organisms, which have been um, taken by people and propagated in different ways to make them do the things that we would like to do, whether that's to, um, you know, be a better crop or a better, you know, a pet or things like that. And of course, my favorite domesticated organism is the yeast Saccharomyces cerevisiae. Um, my pointer doesn't seem to work. Richard, do you have an idea about, um, nope, oh well, never mind. Sorry, we'll, we'll have to do without the pointer. Hopefully you can tell more or less what I'm talking about though. I, I'm seeing your mouse, but it's very small. Oh, okay. <laughs> hmm. All right, well, I'm just gonna do without. Um, didn't think to test that up front, sorry. Um, anyway, so yeast, of course, is my favorite domesticated organism. And, um, you know, you can find yeast in the wild, but of course, yeast is also most well known for all the various um, fermented products that it creates and its close relationship with, with humans. And so um, trying to understand, like, how or have genomes changed in the process of domestication, yeast is like a perfect way to do this because we have um, so many ways to manipulate it because it's been this workhorse of molecular biology and genetics and biochemistry for you know decades, centuries actually, going back to like past year, right? Okay, so um, the reason that um, you know we're really interested in this is because yeast has been domesticated to do just so many different things. Like there's this just huge amount of diversity in the types of products that it makes, the types of uses, the types of niches you find it in the wild. And um, that diversity actually makes it a little bit hard to study. So this is essentially a big family tree of all the yeast sequences that uh, are from this whole set of papers that are, are cited here. And um, 
when you look at this existing genetic diversity, it can be really hard to figure out like, well, what makes this, um, you know, ale strain different from the strain that was found um, associated with, you know, coffee fermentation, um, because there are just too many mutations that are different between the two. So it, it can be like tens of thousands of uh, base pair changes. It can be chromosome copy number changes, all sorts of things. And so it's made it pretty difficult to really connect the genetic changes to the trait changes. And so the alternate way that we're using to approach this question is, well, what if we weren't just stuck with the existing strains that are already domesticated? What if we could keep going with domestication and watch the mutations as they happen? Then it would be much easier to say, well, what changed about the beer at the same time that this mutation came up and see if we can match the two and, and start to understand some of this process. So I was really excited to learn several years ago now that, um, you know, this style of experimental evolution, which is what I do in my lab, we do controlled evolution experiments with yeast and we use genome sequencing to figure out what they're doing. Um, it turns out brewers are, are naturals at this process. You're already doing evolution in place. And that's by the process of reuse of yeast. So um, re reusing or repitching or backslopping yeast um, over and over again is, of course, historically how yeast were always propagated. Um, but even in the modern brewery, it's uh, pretty typical for uh, brewers to um, use their yeast in um, up to maybe you know eight or ten repitches seems to be common. And, you know, why has that been kind of a traditional stopping place? Well, um, this is a, a graphic that I stole from this brewing blog, but it shows uh, yeast getting repitched and eventually turning into zombie yeast or something. And, you know, nobody wants zombie yeast in their beer, right? It sounds, you know, pretty bad. Um, so by zombie yeast, what we're meaning is, you know, something's changing, right, about how the yeast behave, about the product that they're making, about the viability, and perhaps about their genomes that is, is leading to some of this. So um, what I was really, what started this project out entirely was me meeting uh, Tom Schmidlin, who is a graduate of University of Washington, actually, and who repitches um, much more than what uh, Richard found. Thanks, thanks for letting us steal this graphic uh, from you, Richard. I think we found it in a talk of yours somewhere. So uh, let is maybe uh, some editorial uh, permission here. But um, the you know the the typical number of repitches. Uh, Tom goes way beyond the what's typical, and so. Um, the first data set we collected with him was for 26 cycles, and we've, we've done even more than that um, for some experiments uh, that I'll tell you about in a minute. Okay, so the, uh, the second piece of the puzzle is how are we going to watch, right? How can we tell what's going on? And the um, modern genome sequencing um, revolution has really allowed us to, to do this for uh, relatively low cost and at very high resolution for um, you know, each of these samples is, is uh, something that we can sequence. We, we actually have to save up all the samples in the lab so that we have enough to do a sequencing run because sequencing is so easy now. Um, and we ha uh, have been taking the approach of sequencing entire populations so that we can see this kind of changes in representation of mutants as repitching um, goes longer and longer. Okay, so the experiment. We're um, going to sample each batch of beer over one of these repitching time courses, and then we're going to sequence them and see if we can detect genome changes and if we can uh, link those back to traits. And I should mention that, you know, there have been previous studies that looked at the yeast genome over repitching. Um, however, they were using uh, lower, um, uh, you know, looking at chromosome size changes or things like that, things that were just lower resolution than what we're able to do. Um, and they've also been interesting to look at because they come to kind of a whole variety of different conclusions. Some say things are really stable and others say they see change quickly. And so we were wondering what we would see with our um, genome sequencing. Okay, so here is an introduction to postdoc brewing, Tom's operation, and the experiment that we started with. So um, he uses, a, for this experiment, we used Y yeast uh, 1056, and he propped that up, and then started with a pale ale, and then went to a porter, and then went to another pale ale, and then did three batches of IPAs, and then, you know, on and on and on, right? So um, he, the, I think one of the things that you probably all know is, you know, this the, the kind of California, the Cali Ale, right, of, um, of uh, the Chico family of strains um, 
is a really useful all-purpose kind of strain of yeast that can be used for all these different varieties. And um, it's, it's become uh, pretty common and has spread to lots of different breweries and lots of different um, yeast suppliers. And so um, what we did was we found like the, the single track <laughs> through this time course where uh, we avoided these little branches. And um, then we went and um, we, we have samples from more than just is, is shown here, but we sequenced uh, just these five to start because we figured we, we could tell if anything's going on. And then if we wanted to go back in and fill in details, we could always go back and sequence more densely afterwards. Okay. So, um, you know, the, um, this is 26 repitches and the estimate based on kind of biomass increase is about three generations uh, per pitch. Okay, so before I tell you the results, I have to introduce uh, one more thing about um, how, what we know about ale yeasts and their genomes. And uh, that will make, uh, make more sense when we start talking about um, the, the differences that they do. So, so it's currently thought that um, the ale yeasts are the result of a mating event between a kind of Asian wine related strain and a European wine related strain. And this led to a tetraploid that um, has essentially four different chromosome types. So um, you know, you have a set of chromosomes from your mom and a set of chromosomes from your dad. It's as though ale yeast kind of have a set of four parents <laughs> that they've gotten their chromosomes from. So they've got all this genetic variation. And so that genetic variation in the ensuing, you know, hundreds of years since the, this uh, hybridization happened has, has led to all sorts of uh, chromosome rearrangement, chromosome copy number changing, all sorts of funny business in the genome. Their genomes are just amazing and a mess. It's, it's wonderful to work with. And so, so for some things you maintain that variation like chromosome A here, um, but for others like chromosome C, you, you've lost a chromosome and you're left with only one type of that chromosome. And you can even get swaps between chromosomes like is shown for chromosome B here with where you have got part of a pink chromosome and part of a blue chromosome. So our question was, if we now took this strain and followed it in um, the brewery, you know, would we see more of the same or would we not see much at all? Okay, so what did we get? Um, the other thing that we saw in addition to, um, oops, sorry, I skipped a slide. Um, so one thing that we saw right away was that we were seeing differences in chromosome copy number changes. So that is, um, the case where, in, in this case, we're looking at chromosome five, and I thought I'd throw in some real data here to show you the kind of um, output that we're getting from our sequencing. And um, what we're doing here is each of the dots represents how many times we sequenced that little segment of the genome. Uh, because the way that sequencing works is we shred up the whole genome, and then we sequence little bits of it, and then we ask, where did that bit come from, and does it have differences versus what we expect? And so this is kind of um, averaged together across the genome, and you can see that um, we start out with three copies of this chromosome and it kind of inches upward over the time course until by the end on pitch 26, we estimate that it's about 40% of the entire population, uh, which is nothing to sneeze at. That's pretty impressive um, to achieve 40% of a large, large population like this. Um, so what this is, is chromosome five and it started at three copies and it's gone to four copies. Um, the other type of chromosome change that we saw um, is, uh, is a little more subtle. So it doesn't change the number of chromosomes, but it changes which chromosome is there. So, you know, like I said, if we have, um, you know, one set of chromosomes from mom and one from dad, you can have a mistake in how the chromosomes segregate when a cell divides, such that um, instead of having the exact duplicate, which um, is what's supposed to happen when the cells in your body divide, you can end up with a cell that either has two of the maternal or two of the paternal chromosomes. And you might think, well, why, why does that matter? Because you still have two chromosomes, so shouldn't you be okay? And it, it does actually matter. You can imagine, like, let's say the blue copy has a non-functional copy of a particular gene, and the green copy has the, the normal copy. Well, the, if you ended up with two of the green copies, you'd be okay. But if you ended up with two of the non-functional copies, then, then you wouldn't. And even having one good copy is usually good enough. So in this case, like it, the original state where you had one blue and one green, you were probably all right. So this kind of a missegregation event can have um, consequences because it changes the proportion of um, copies with different, if the copies are different from each other. Okay, so how to look at this you know, sequencing data gets a little bit complicated, so um, bear with me here. So um, let's say that we have a set where we have all four chromosomes look the same and are identical to each other. Then the, um, you know, you can't, you, there's, there's only all have the same base or none have the same base. 
um, depending if you look at the uh, frequency of different changes there. However, let's say we have a green chromosome where we have some genetic differences versus the blue chromosomes. Then that's a ratio of three to one. And depending on how the mutations um, map onto these different chromosome copies, you can end up with these uh, different bands of chromosome um, allele frequencies that are, this is just graphed over the length of the chromosome. So we're seeing sections that have these different allele frequencies. So in this case, you know, if we only have uh, the green copy having a particular mutation, then we get a one to three ratio, or we get a three to one ratio if it's on the blue copy, um, or we can have all of them having a mutation, or we can have none of them having a mutation, or we can start getting um, mutations that make the, the blue copies a little different from each other. And you can imagine how this gets even more complicated <laughs> once we start adding extra or lost chromosomes. And if once we stop thinking about just two types of chromosomes, but three or four types of chromosomes. And so you can end up with all sorts of um, complication here. So um, I'm going to show you uh, one chromosome <laughs> that is particularly interesting to us because we did see one of these changes in uh, chromosome uh, balance in this way. So this is chromosome eight. And again, this mutation reached about 40% of the total population. So um, it, it turns out to be a non-overlapping group from the set that has the extra chromosome. So it, the whole population is about 80% mutant by the time um, we sequence the endpoint. And what you can tell at time zero here is that this chromosome has already historically had some chromosome balance uh, issues. So um, I drew that as a little cartoon below, or I should say Chris Large, the graduate student who has been working on this project, uh, drew this. Chris has been um, just really great at both working with the brewers. He's a home brewer himself and um, also is excellent at all this genomics. So um, he's been really fun to work with, and he just defended his thesis um, and to talk about this work just the other day. So that, it's been uh, exciting to have him working on this project. Um, so what you can see here is that the left side of the chromosome, there are three types and you can get ratios of um, three to one, one to three, and two to two. On the right-hand side of the chromosome, we already historically got rid of one of those, uh, the light, lightest blue one. And so we only have a 75% and a 25% um, because of the only two that are left and they're present in a three to one ratio. So over the time course, what we saw was this ratio changed. And um, you can see that the farthest right side of the chromosome seems to be getting closer and closer and closer to a ratio of 50-50. And so um, what's happening here is that we're seeing a recombination event that is moving part of the dark blue chromosome on the right to the lighter blue chromosome and replacing it. So there's no change in copy number, there's just a change in uh, which copies are there. Um, you might notice this kind of sloping pattern, and we were initially a little bit confused by that until we went and started sequencing individual clones. Remember, the data that I've been showing you so far has been on mixed populations. So we take just a whole like little tube of the slurry and sequence the whole thing. So um, when you start sequencing individuals, what we found is that we see a bunch of different breakpoints, a bunch of different points where the the, the two chromosomes uh, are different from each other and, and switch over from one to the other. And these happen at different points in different clones. So we have uh, several clones and they each have a different region of the chromosome that's swapped in this way, but they all have the end, the very end in common. And so that's why the end is the closest to 50-50 and the further into the chromosome you get, it gets a little um, less because fewer and fewer cells in the population have this uh, rearrangement of that particular region. Okay, so, you know, I am a geneticist. I like replication. <laughs> we spent, you know, a very long time on this uh, experiment. You know, Tom had to make all the beer. You know, we had to collect all the samples and do all the sequencing. Um, and we got, a, you know, N of one, right? But we found already two really interesting looking mutations and we could show that they were at high frequencies in the population. So what would happen if we did it all over again? So luckily uh, Tom was game to uh, collect another time course for us. Uh, this time starting with Imperial um, version of the Chico strain, which is um, uh, slightly different, but pretty close. Um, and he went for 29 repitches this time. And uh, much to my amazement, we found exactly the same mutations we're taking over in these cultures. And in fact, the chromosome five uh, copy number change actually 
the pitch that they'd gotten from Imperial already had that at a detectable level and it, it took over from there. And so, and we did actually, in this case, find some double mutants, some that had the chromosome five extra copy and the chromosome eight um, recombination of it. Okay, well, what if it's just something going on in Tom's brewery and that we're selecting for, you know, something really special here? Um, well, let's look at other breweries. And so this was the point where, you know, I got to talk to uh, a bunch of great uh, brewer friends who have been really uh, generous to let us um, sequence their samples and also to collect for us, which is not trivial to do that in the, you know, all the other things you guys got going on in the brew house, right? And so um, all of these have in common that they are some strain related to the Chico strains family. And um, they have gone for, uh, you know, some fewer, like Elysian doesn't go out as far for their repitches, but, um, you know, a Red Circle went all the way to repitch 36, which is a pretty, pretty good. Um, and what we found was that um, we saw, again, the same mutations happening. Um, and there's one that I didn't show here. There's a chromosome 15 recombination that we also got multiple times that we hadn't initially seen in the first postdoc brewing sample. So um, this kind of replication really indicates that you're onto something <laughs> in an experiment like this. So when we do our laboratory-based evolution experiments, you know, when we get the same mutation multiple times in multiple independent experiments, it usually means that there's some benefit to it because it's able to escape the, um, you know, all the, the rare mutations that are just constantly happening and it's able to outgrow all of its brethren to the point where we can see it. The other thing that was really interesting about the replicates was that when we started looking at the initial strains, we found that some of the initial strains actually already had some of the mutations that over the repitching we were accumulating. And so that's kind of shown on this. Uh, this is a, you can imagine that that family tree that I showed earlier, this is just the zoom in on the little part of the family tree that is um, all of the uh, strains related to the, the Chico family. Um, and so we, we actually uh, bought a bunch of different um, commercial strains and some places were kind enough to send us their strains to sequence. And um, what you see here is that it's colored in according to um, if it's got three copies or four copies of chromosome five. And remember the um, initial postdoc brewing sample started out with three copies of chromosome five and went to four copies. And so the ones that are in blue here have now gotten this fourth copy. And so this is something that doesn't just happen in, you know, postdoc brewings brew house, but also has happened as these yeasts have been passed around, as these yeasts have been grown up by these uh, companies and, and as breweries have used them. Um, the little pointer at the bottom there tells you that that whole group of yeast there has that chromosome eight recombination event already. So um, that's been really interesting to look at um, because, you know, it's this whole group. And so all of them have inherited it. Um, so it probably happened once on that, that branch. And then what, you, what, what you're seeing is kind of that's back in time. And then all the little branches are the, the ones that we were able to get our hands on in sequence. And the length is how long kind of we estimate um, how many mutations are between uh, those strains that are connected. Um, so uh, probably some of you see your own favorite strains here, and I think there's a lot of really interesting detail in here that um, some of which uh, we've been able to figure out and, and some of which has been a little more complicated, but um, it's been really fun to get to work with so many people to, to look at the fine scale of how this strain has, has kind of been spread around and, and changed its genome. Okay. So what are the genes on these chromosomes? I told you that there are these mutations, they affect large swaths of chromosomes, and they um, seem to look like the mutations that have happened over kind of historical time as these strains have been domesticated. So um, what might be driving this change? So uh, one of the regions of the genome that we were of course really interested in was this right arm of chromosome eight where we saw that switch happening. And so we were curious about like, well, what could be driving that? It could be something on the dark blue chromosome we want more copies of, or something on the light blue chromosome we want less copies of. Um, but what Chris noticed is that um, he's got a real eagle eye for these uh, genome sequencing uh, data. And he noticed that one of the light blue chromosomes was different than the others and actually had a mutation that was unique to only that copy. And it was in a gene called BAT1. And we got really interested in BAT1 um, because BAT1 turns out to be a big metabolic player. And so this is a little diagram of the cell 
um, where BAT1 is an enzyme that is involved in branch chain amino acid biosynthesis. So it makes valine and leucine and isoleucine from precursors. And um, some of the side products of some of these reactions are things like isobutanol, isoamyl alcohol, and, and things like that. So flavor molecules that um, would be of interest. And uh, we were lucky enough to get invited to um, this t uh, conference in uh, Argentina that was about brewing and also attached to a yeast co a genetics conference. And Chris uh, presented some of this work and we turned out to meet like the world expert on bat one biology, <laughs> uh, Hiroshi Takogi. And so he very kindly uh, collaborated with us and um, they cloned the uh, beer strain allele and uh, compared it to the, the normal allele that's found everywhere else and did a few different tests to see if there was a difference between these alleles. And so it turns out that if you have the normal sequence, and I should mention, this is all in a lab strain. So we'd love to redo these experiments in brewing strains, but we haven't been able to do that yet. Um, but in the lab strain, you see that you normally have pretty low levels of all these um, other alcohols. But if you delete this gene entirely, you get rid of it entirely, then you make a bunch more. So um, instead of turning you know, these intermediates into like valine and leucine, they turn them into these other alcohols. So the beer strain sequence looks strikingly like if you just delete the gene entirely. So what we think is going on here is that um, this particular strain has one bad copy of BAT1, and by this recombination event, it's getting rid of it. And we think that that's the case because when we looked at all those clones, it wasn't as though they were just getting rid of one of the light blue copies at random. They were always getting rid of the end that had the BAT1 mutation. So something about getting rid of that mutation is beneficial to them. And, you know, it's hard to select on something like flavor molecules, right? Like, well, how is that going to give them a growth advantage in the giant fermenter, right? And so the other thing that they checked was how well these strains grow at different levels of glucose, because this gene is known to regulate um, response to um, how the, the, that process. And so, again, the one in the middle is the normal gene, and the one on the top and the one on, is the deleted gene, and the one on the bottom is the beer allele. And what this is showing is little patches of yeast and they're they're plated in dilution so that you can see how well they grow. And if you look at the 30% glucose, which admittedly is a lot of glucose, <laughs> you can tell that the, the one with the normal copy grows pretty well and the other two are, are pretty uh, sickly. So we think that that's what's providing this benefit, that by getting rid of this one bad copy of BAT1, you uh, might be able to grow better now in uh, the high sugar environment. Okay. However, BAT1, it turned out, cannot be the whole story. And that's because I left off one landmark on this tree that I showed you before. And um, that's where the BAT1 mutation occurred. So the BAT1 mutation we found out was only in a subset of the strains that we were working with. And in fact, the strain used by Elysian, for example, um, and the strain used by Red Circle did not have this BAT1 allele. In fact, had three normal copies of BAT1 on that segment of the chromosome. Um, so we started looking for additional genes that, that could help explain why this uh, chromosome rearrangement was favored over and over and over again. And um, the gene that we found that we're really excited about is um, related to flocculation. So this crowd probably doesn't need as much of an introduction to flocculation, but this is the process of yeast cells sticking to each other. And so, um, you know, a nice lab strain where we don't like stickiness, this has had its bread out of it. And so when a yeast cell buds, that bud separates completely from the mother cell and floats away and cannot stick. And so you end up with a cloudy culture. Whereas if the um, culture is capable of flocculation, then the cells can stick to each other and make these uh, macro sized clumps that you can actually see um, you know, without the aid of a microscope or anything um, if you agitate the tube. And um, so in order to find this gene, this gene evaded us for a long time. And it wasn't until my friend Joseph Shusher um, agreed to use a new sequencing technology, long read sequencing, to sequence some of these genomes that we were able to figure it out. Um, because it turns out that this um, chromosome 8, again, um, the dark blue one has itself acquired a little extra bit of another chromosome. It's got a little bit on its end of chromosome 1. And one of the genes in that region is this uh, flow 1 gene that is related to flocculation. And so by having this recombination event where we have the dark blue chromosome go from one copy to two copies at the very end there, we're also amplifying the copy number of 
the flow one gene. <laughs> so we're getting extra copies of flow one. So that could make them uh, flocculate better and could make them settle out better. And of course, um, the way that Tom um, Harvest has yeast is he um, selects them from the cone for uh, repassaging. So, so if you are um, settling out better in a place that is where Tom selects from when he picks who goes to the next round, then that could provide an advantage. So um, this is really an interesting gene. Um, it's, you know, uh, we wanted to really show that this is likely to be true. So Chris did a classic Helms assay to look for flocculation behavior of some of our clones that we've sequenced that we knew either had or didn't have these various uh, gene contents. So um, shown on the left here are our starting strain. Um, in this case, um, this is from our first experiment with uh, postdoc ring. So this is a strain that has both the BAT1 allele and it has this extra little flow one bit. And on the right is a positive control. So what you do is you uh, put your yeast into a tube, you shake it up, and then you let it settle. And then you take the top of it off and ask, you know, how cloudy is it, essentially. So um, if it is flocculent, then they will sink to the bottom really fast. And so it's not very cloudy. But if they are not flocculent, then they take their sweet time about it and you still get some after six minutes. So you can see that the initial strains are at about 50% in six minutes. Um, the positive control in this case is just a strain that we know flocculates really well. And so it, it's completely gone in six minutes. Okay, so here are some evolved clones from the very end that either have the chromosome five recombination um, or that have just gotten rid of the BAT1 allele, but not by recombining with the uh, dark blue chromosome. So this happened occasionally in our experiments. We, we've only found a couple of clones that did this, um, but it does look like you can find other ways to get rid of the BAT1 allele than just the recombination that we saw. But none of these seem to have a strong effect on flocculation. Um, instead, when we looked at the clones that had gotten rid of the BAT1 allele, but in the context of also increasing the copy number of the little green bit, which has flow one, we saw that all of these strains had much increased flocculation. So in this case, we really do think that um, this is partially what must be driving the success of this strain in um, the brewery. Um, one neat historical fact. Um, you know, why are these strains still changing so much when they've been used for brewing for, you know, a, a very long period of time? And, you know, uh, one of our hypotheses is that modern brewing practices are different than the, um, pr the practices that were in play when these strains were um, kind of being domesticated originally. And with the advent of freezers and yeast supply companies and yeast banking operations, um, you know, the evolution of yeast has kind of been frozen in, you know, the mid-1900s, right? And so top skimming used to be um, more frequent. Um, and there are, of course, brewers who still do top skimming, but this is just a great uh, graphic from Ballantine, which is where the progenitor of the Chico varieties came from, um, just showing, you know, the big map of yeast foam at the top that um, is being skimmed off. And so by moving to um, collecting from the cone uh, and looking for more settling behavior, it could be that um, that's part of what's changed about um, how, how brewing works that's now putting new selective pressures on the yeast and allowing them to adapt in new ways. Okay, so um, the implications here, yeast are still adapting. There is still um, new things to learn in the brewery for the yeast. Um, we've got one case here where we've got a flavor gene that's linked to a flocculation gene. And I really think that's a super interesting model um, because you know it's been kind of a longstanding question of how, how do we get the, the changes in metabolites that lead to flavor changes in the beer um, if those changes themselves don't cause a benefit. Um, you know, it's not like a brewer could isolate a whole bunch of individuals and, and check each one of them for flavor over, you know, historical time. So, um, but if the flavor gene is accidentally linked to something that affects either growth or affects um, the ability to settle or something, and in this case, we think the flavor gene itself is also related to um, ability to grow, right, because of that um, high sugar content growth phenotype. You know, it's really an interesting model though for how traits could evolve, that these large scale chromosome changes that affect multiple genes at once can, can have uh, multiple traits affected um, just by the way the genome is organized. Um, another thing I'd like to remind people is that mutants can be good or bad, <laughs> right? So um, Tom likes the beer from one of our mutants better. Um, we 
brewed, he brewed a, um, some mutants and the ancestor strain. And we did a um, taste test at um, homebrew con a few years ago and did find um, some preferences for um, some of the mutants. So um, it's, it's kind of a, you know, it used to be, and it still is actually very typical for how uh, different brew houses to kind of pre-adapt their house strains and, and use something that works for them really well. And, you know, what I'd like to do is get my hands on sequencing of the time course of some of these and asking, has that really kind of slowed down evolution? Because you've maybe gotten the big bang mutations that cause really large benefits to the yeast, but now are they out of mutations that kind of give them these big benefits and you don't see quite as much change going forward? Um, I will mention that one thing that's kind of a missing link here is that, you know, Tom didn't notice the traits changing in a meaningful way that correlated much with how our sequencing went. Um, so that's one thing that um, we're hoping to do with some of our, our new collaborations. And Tom's also continuing to collect for us, which is great, um, but is to get um, data on the different uh, beers and try to... Um, you know, connect that to how different strain dynamics are happening in these. Um, we've gotten some nice data from uh, Elysian, for example, was very kind to share with us some of the data they collect on their beers. But, you know, how to connect that to the changes in frequency ha has not been straightforward so far. Okay. Um, kindly, Richard, put the preprint link in the chat. So um, we are in the process of revising this to resubmit it after getting some um, useful reviewer comments. And so um, if you would like to also submit some comments, then uh, feel free to email me. Uh, we always actually uh, we, we published another beer paper a few years ago, um, and a brewer who read it caught a mistake that we'd made, and neither of the academic reviewers caught it. <laughs> and so I was really glad that we fixed it before the paper uh, actually got pr got um, printed out. So, um, you know, your knowledge of, of yeast and metabolism is is really helpful here. Um, okay, I want to end with just a few caveats, and then I'll, I'll end with a plea for, for extra things. So first, um, you know, I referred a few times to this reference. We have mutations versus the reference. So um, what that means is that in the mid-90s, a uh, lab strain of yeast was sequenced really, really well. <laughs> and so that genome is beautiful. It's like they, they changed a couple of base pairs in the last 10 years, right? It's just like in very good shape, but it's a lab strain. And so it turns out that it doesn't have some of the genes that brewing strains do. So in particular, uh, the lab strain can't eat maltose. Like what self-respecting yeast strain can't eat maltose, right? That's a, it's pretty ridiculous. And so when we get a sequence from the maltose genes in the brewing strains, it doesn't have a place to go in the reference genome. So we have to have special analysis where we create a maltose gene for the, the sequence reads to match to and uh, go and look at them on purpose. And so um, this has been a, a great undergrad project that um, actually I've had a really uh, great pair of undergrads who got benched from the lab during the pandemic and instead became computational biologists and started doing some of the genome analysis on these and have some, some really nice results there so that, that we can look at some of these genes. The flocculation genes are also just like very hard genes to study because they have lots of repeats that make the sequencing complicated. So in any case, these genes that require special analysis are also really interesting and so it's worth the effort. Okay, number two, I already mentioned this, that the experiment showing the big difference in functionality between the BAT1 alleles, for example, that was all done in a lab strain. And that's just because it's so much easier to engineer the genomes of the lab strains and, and work with them in the lab and everything. But we'd like to be able to do those experiments in the brewing strains. Um, the strains that I showed you, I, I had little cartoons showing what their chromosomes looked like, but that's not the only thing happening in those genomes. We also find point mutations in different genes in, in those strains. None of them reach that high frequency, like I saw for the chromosome changes, but they're not exactly identical. And so the um, possibility remains that we're, you know, there are other mutations in there that really matter, and we'd like to know that if that's true. So we've been working on applying CRISPR to the brewing strains to try to um, edit the genome and to try to create chromosome rearrangements. And uh, we've had a little bit of success there, but um, need to, to work on it harder. Okay, and finally, you know, all of these uh, breweries use these Chico related strains and how the yeast strain matters and how the style of beer matters and how the style of repitching matters is fascinating to me. And I would love to do more experiments. And so 
you know, uh, just this week, actually, Richard hooked me up with a, a new collaborator who is, is working on a, a different strain that I'd love to look at. We've gotten some uh, samples sent by um, Spencer Grimm from Grimm Ales, which uh, he does top cropping. And so I'm really excited to look at those. Um, we've sequenced a couple of um, quack time points also from Richard, and those are really complicated and fascinating. Um, so I'd love to reach out to people who are doing this sort of long-term repitching and have an interest in collecting samples for me um, that might be using uh, different types of strains and also different types of products. Um, so I recently got to go to the American Society for Brewing Chemists meeting and I learned about seltzer fermentation and just how ridiculous it is. And I would love to get some strains if anybody is doing repitching on seltzer, which you might not be because of many of the talks are about how to keep my yeast happy when I'm forcing them to make seltzer. Um, so uh, other things like that, though, I, I we, we've... Um, We've been really uh, looking for uh, ways to expand this work um, in a few different directions, um, basing, basing it on the great results that we were able to get with this, this first study here. Okay, and with that, I want to make sure to thank my lab. Um, so there's Chris. He's all the way over on the side there wearing his postdoc brewing t-shirt. <laughs> He's worked really closely with Noah Hansen, uh, who's in the middle, and Noah actually as, uh, he was a microbiology major at UW when he started working in my lab as an undergraduate, and he got interested in microbiology by virtue of being a home brewer. And so um, he's really led the charge, and we, we've been trying to get um, fermentations in lab to work. And so he's got, uh, we call it the lab, the science beer recipe, um, where uh, we don't want to autoclave it to sterilize it because it'll caramelize the sugars, but we can't just boil it because it needs to be truly sterile. So we've got this complicated filtering uh, procedure that he figured out, which, which has been working really well for us. And um, Anna and Andrea are the two undergraduates who I mentioned are, are working on the last project. And Barbara Dunn has been a longtime collaborator and is working on a variety of beer projects with me. And of course, thanks to all of our great uh, brewer collaborators and um, the collaborators on some of the um, uh, sequencing and the uh, biochemical analysis that I, I talked about earlier. Um, yeah, so uh, with that, I will be happy to talk more with all of you and take questions and get comments and ideas back. So thank you. <laughs> Brewing yeast genetics, it's a mess indeed. That was awesome. Thanks so much. The sun uh, is shining right in my eyes. <laughs> yeah, no worries. Tons of information. I hope everyone was uh, was able to absorb that. If you're not, uh, we'll throw this up on, on our YouTube channel as always. If you're not already subscribing to our YouTube channel, uh, make sure you do that. That, that helps us reach more uh, beer nerds like you as well. So that's always appreciated, all the likes and comments and all that stuff. Um, yeah, what a, what a great, what a great project and really, you know, what a nice example of collaboration, you know, on the academic and on the industrial side, you know, between breweries and, and yeast geneticists to try to answer some of the questions about, you know, stuff that every brewer, almost every brewer is doing, right? Like reusing yeast and asking these fundamental questions of how does it change, which really, at least in, in from what I've seen, this is the first good crack at answering this with, with ale yeast. So it, it's a pretty cool um, project. And yeah, if anyone's, I'm sure there's even more people out there that are repitching yeast for extended periods of time. And, you know, I know it doesn't benefit my business, but I'm always curious to find out because it tells us more about, uh, you know, about what works and what doesn't with the yeast. So yeah, I actually did hear from a brewer a week ago that they had repitched our foggy London ale 62 times and wow. they, they sent us a sample so we're going to send that over to, to matria to to study and find out how it's changed because you know we have the the base strain sequence so that's that's very exciting well you know hopefully some of this does end up feeding back to you and you'll get new strains that you can sell because they are you know evolved mutants that are better right well yeah i mean that that's something that you you sort of suggested towards the end of the talk is that you know maybe some of this is beneficial to like in general there must be a reason why the yeast is changing and some of this might be beneficial and might actually result in more stable products. So we're definitely curious about that. We're definitely thinking about that kind of stuff. Um, so there are some questions uh, if you're, if you're willing to answer. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Awesome. Um, and there's a little bit of voting going on as well. So if anyone wants to uh, vote on your favorite question, make sure you do. 
Um, but the top one right now is uh, I won. It's it's a question that I wrote. Um, have you considered looking at repitching multi-strain yeast like Ringwood or traditional Quike? Um, are they actually stable? Oh, yeah. No, Quike is so interesting. Um, <laughs> so um, we we did sequence a couple of time points that you sent us that were a couple of years apart, which was pretty pretty great. And um, you know, they're a mixture of strains. They're not a clone like uh, all the ones that I just talked about. And one thing that was fascinating to me, it was particularly given just how fast, you know, we saw these mutants take over. You know, we, we saw things go from undetectable to, you know, 80% of the whole population is mutant, right? In just a few months. So how is it that these strains are, you know, we, we thought maybe, well, one of the strains will just take over by the next time we sequence that, right? One will, will win. But that wasn't the case at all. We actually saw that all the different strains were still represented. Their abundances had shifted a little bit, but... Um, but the complexity was still there. And so that's fascinating to me. That says there's something about the uh, mixture that's more than just a bunch of individual strains. That maybe they're working together in some way. They're supporting each other's growth in some way. They specialize at different phases of when the brew cycle happens or who's good dried on the wreath versus who's good when it hits the wart or you know who knows what, right? But um, I, I think it's really super interesting. We, we had also done another sequencing experiment where we looked at a um, open fermented beer that was full of all sorts of bugs. It was it was amazing. And so just seeing how, and that's a similar kind of idea where you have these communities of organisms, in this case, not different strains of the same species, but different species, bacteria and yeast and different types of yeast. Um, and those also kind of undergo you know, phases where, you know, different species are, are increased or decreased, or they specialize on, on different phases of the, the fermentation and um, how that process works and how the genetics of the organism matters and might change over time is something that, that we're really interested in. So um, I, I just got a new collaborator who um, is in Seattle. So uh, we're going to do some cool ship collections over the season uh, when he gets started up in the, in the winter and hopefully it start to, and then, you know, this is going to be a long term because it's like what a three year barrel fermentation <laughs> run. So you know, you'll have to invite me back in like three or four years <laughs> until to figure out how that experiment goes. But, you know, I, I do like thinking about how these things uh, work together in mixtures as opposed to just being little clonal populations. Yeah, for sure. It just, it does make the science a lot harder. Yeah. Well, and also some of those strains are harder to grow. And so, you know, I'd like to be able to assemble a community and then let it go and then mess with it and see how it changes and everything. And so that's been a little bit tough, but there are people trying mm -hmm. to do that. And so I think there's, there, um, and there are like genetic techniques that'll work now and most of these things. So, you know, there, there's potential there. Yeah. Quite could be a really good model for that kind of work because that that's something that we've seen is that oftentimes the communities are fairly stable, like even in propagation. Yeah, um, well, you know, gosh, I'd love to get my hands on anybody doing quite uh, passaging and uh, repitching mm -hmm. because it's mm -hmm. like, well, okay, you've been in a Norwegian farmhouse backyard for all these decades, and now you're putting a stainless steel fermenter. <laughs> what is your life like now? What do you care about? What's different for you? What mutations might you get? Now maybe one strain will win. Who knows, right? So um, uh, that'd be mm -hmm. really, really interesting to look at. Oh, for sure. Okay, we got another question. On a homebrew scale, how many times should a, a neutral, clean yeast like Cali be repitched before drastically changing? I guess, you know, what can we expect, uh, you know, at the homebrew scale if, if we're reusing the yeast? Yeah, it's that's a really interesting question. Um, I think that the um, how many times you can reuse things on a homebrew scale is is probably more determined by um, your own sanitary techniques and how it, long it takes for something to get con contaminated. Um, the other thing that we've gotten really interested in is how well the yeast do between batches. So you know how people store their yeast is like it mostly sits in the back of their fridge <laughs> or something for a while and then they wake it back up and get it. and even at the big breweries right it's like oh you put the um you know the the keg with the yeast into the cold room for a while and bring out the brink the next time you're you're gonna uh do your your thing and so we we wonder how much selection is going on there like how much is dying off in the cold room or things can still grow some in the cold room versus others. And, and the same thing is probably happening in the back of your refrigerator. Um, you know, the earliest that we have seen changes is, is actually the yeast store. 
<laughs> so another thing that Richard's not going to like me saying here, but um, you know, we have found that even um, the the just uh, the pitch that you initially buy can already have detectable levels of some of these. Um, mutations in them, um, which is not a surprise because it's the same things that they're getting fed in the same conditions that they're growing in. So, you know, more or less, right? So uh, I think there's there's definitely selection happening at that point too. Um, so it might be too late for you by the time it gets to you, but what mutations you're seeing, I mean, things are, are a small population. We actually work with really small populations in my lab, just like 20 mils, and we can see all sorts of genetic changes happening in the space of a month of growth. So, um, you know, the small populations still can evolve fast for sure. And in fact, the bigger populations can be harder because they got to get up in frequency. So um, I would say, you know, it's all very practical. I think when things start behaving badly, you know, attenuating in ways that are not happy or you see sluggish um, fermentation starting or the flavors develop off things, you know, it's time to stop. So um, that has been, uh, that's been one thing it's been fun to talk to the professional brewers about like, you know, what if we could speed our process up and get you sequencing in real time, you know, pretty close to when you're doing your brewing, would you use that to kind of decide when to go? And it, it, it because we haven't necessarily seen syncing up of the uh, flavor changes or behavior changes to when we start detecting these mutations, that, that doesn't seem like it, it's going to be a, a helpful thing to do yet. And, but, you know, mm -hmm. we'll, we'll see what happens as we get more and more of this data. That's awesome. And you already started to answer another question that I, that I was going to pose, which is, you know, understanding that yeast evolution doesn't stop, you know, what, what does that mean for people that are, that are uh, yeast companies, right, that are producing and selling yeast, you know, recognizing that what most yeast companies are doing is producing a lot of yeast biomass, which means a lot of generations yeah. of growth, which then does mean that there's capacity for mutation and you know, what are the implications in terms of quality assurance um, on the yeast labs end? And, you know, what could we do to address it? I think, you know, I'm not going to shy away from that question. I'm, I'm legitimately curious because I think that might hold some answers to, you know, some of the consistency problems that come up. Yeah, well, actually, most of the generations of the yeast life are spent with you, <laughs> right? Because you're mm -hmm. actually going from a very small volume of yeast to a really large volume. And so that expansion, there's lots of room. So let's let's imagine that you got a mutation. And that mutation is one of my favorites that seems to be beneficial. And let's say it happened really early. It's going to lead to lots of downstream cells because it's got lots of room to grow exponentially. Whereas once it hits the brewery and there's only, you know, three generations each time, it's like got less of a shot at really uh, changing its abundance. And so it can, but um, you know, it's, it can be a little harder. So I think that because of that tremendous outgrowth that you're having to do, it's, it's um, gonna be hard to avoid that. We call them jackpots. When you get a mutation that it just happened to be in a lucky time point so that it, it started early enough that it can make lots of progeny. Um, so, you know, you're, you're kind of stuck with that as a problem, I think. I, I, you know, one idea would be, could you do many small props and combine them to make as much biomass as you want, but each one's got less chance, less generations and fewer opportunities for a particular mutant to take over. But, you know, that poses its own practical problems and sterility problems and all sorts of things. So, Yeah, yeah, it is actually something we're exploring in a, in a slightly different way. So, oh, you know, all of this stuff has been very inspiring for us. Um, yeah, sort of looking at our comments when you, when you, when you talked about the, you know, the brewer hauling out the keg full of yeast, someone uh, responded, can confirm. <laughs> so yeah, very much. Uh, no, that other, is something I'm curious about too, is like, the cold room oh, sorry. we've noticed is that, um, a lot of the, um, samples that we have collected from breweries, um, are real, they have real viability problems. And so yes. we freeze everything in this, you know, industrial minus 80 C freezer and that, and we store them in glycerol so that they've got a cryoprotectant. And even with all that, we still see a really huge drop off in viability of a lot of the brewing yeast. And so we, we just started a project to see if we can evolve better freeze thaw tolerance. Um, so how, how these things are dealing with temperature shifts and, and sort of, I think there is something special about what's going on with the, the brewing strains. Yeah, for sure. And some of them are honestly a little bit wimpy when it comes to shelf life. So, mm -hmm. you know, if we can evolve that to be a little bit better, that, that would solve a lot of problems too, because I know there's a lot of brewers that really want to be able to store their yeast for, you know, three or four weeks in the brink and just can't. Yeah. Right. No. And we're also trying to figure out if we can get better, 
um, viability in a plain commercial freezer, just, you know, minus 20 C freezer. So oh, um, I'm curious. Yeah. Oh, we'll, we'll see. We've got some <laughs> that's, that's actually motivating. We've been doing some evolution experiments with high school classrooms. And so they definitely don't have minus 80 freezers. And so uh, we've been, we, we they, they can actually get away with like about nine months in the normal, like break room freezer <laughs> um, before you, you get down too low in viability. So we're going to, see how, how good we can get that's awesome and there's a lot of home brewers that even just you know store yeast uh cold or frozen yeah. for longer periods of time right so that would be i don't know if anyone's really done that research so that would be a really useful resource well and that's something that i learned when I, i've talked to, to home brewers in particular is that like a lot of them will save their yeast in the freezer but they'll wake it up and make a new stock every you know six months or something and mm -hmm. so that's an evolution experiment in itself right so you know how have they changed their own strain by by storing it and then recycling it. And then, you know, the other common ways like on a slant in the cold room and even some yeast companies, I think we're doing that for a very long time in big breweries. Um, and you know, what's it doing in there? Um, you know, it'd be neat to follow. Yeah, we've we've seen direct if we keep yeast on plates or slants for too long, like we kind of have to go back to frozen stock pretty frequently. Yeah. All right, you already answered another question <laughs> ahead of time. It was when he was asking about, you know, yeah, basically how to how to maintain a yeast over time as a home oh, brewer. Great. Um, so yeah, that's a possible answer is you know finding some some ways to freeze it and, and have it survive. But right now that's easier said than done. Um, and also work on your technique. You know, I think that home brewers can actually do really well with this. You know, make sure that you're um, being really careful about all your equipment and sanitizing things. Um, you know, there are um, at HomebrewCon, actually, there was a, a fun talk from one of the brewers at uh, Full Sail, I think, who had how to build a, a yeast lab and how to do things in a sterile way and how to check your yeast viability and, and stuff like that. There, You can get like super cheap um, hemocytometers for counting cells online these days and, you know, little toy microscopes that are better than you know, a lot of like microscopes that you use in school and everything. So, you know, there, there are lots of ways that you can kind of up your game if you want to on, on that front. And even in a homebrew operation, like I've got a little home microscope that I, I, you know, it's fun to just look at things from time to time. Yeah, so do I. It, it happens, I think, when you're when you're in this deep. <laughs> <laughs> But I, I make bread at home. So it's nice to be able to check check on the sourdough. Yeah. Uh, you know, all that stuff. Oh, okay. Here's another thing. If anyone knows the answer to this, uh, maybe I can uh, pump this crowd for ideas. So I would love to be able to do the same experiment, but in sourdough starter um, with a pure culture of yeast, not the mixed population, and just repropagate it and follow mutations. And I'm stuck. I cannot figure out how to sterilize the flour. Um, because the grocery store flour comes with all sorts of delightful fungal spores hanging out in it, which um, outcompete the lab yeast, which I already mentioned was kind of sad, right? It outcompetes it real quick. And so I haven't been able to do more than a few transfers. Um, so I, I um, have, I'm going to try this autoclaving protocol where you the, the steam from the autoclave doesn't get into the sample, so you don't end up with a Paste, but I tried irradiating it and that just made the fungal spores germinate better, <laughs> which was kind of scary. Um, so if anybody's got a lead on sterile flour, let me know. Yeah, someone's saying uh, oh, Ben Wolf, ben Wolf uh, yeah. autoclase flour. Uh, we've we've baked flour before. Yeah, I tried like, that too. It didn't like, work so well. Okay, it, it toasts, so it, it changes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, UV okay, maybe so too. Like, yeah, no, you could do a, a UV treatment. Thank you, Chantel. Oh. Sous vide, <laughs> yeah. Well, that's the idea is I'm going to put it in a, um, a silicone bag and see if that still gets the pressure. Oh, we'll see. Yes. Yeah. OK. That's cool. Adapting yeast in, 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 in sourdough over time. Uh, OK, we've got a couple more questions. Um, actually, this is something I'm, I'm going to rephrase the question slightly. So I apologize, Brent, but I'm going to I'm going to rephrase your question um, because I think it's an interesting thing to talk about. So that there is this uh, I, I wouldn't say common knowledge or common wisdom that yeast improves after a few repitches. Mm -hmm. What do you think might be going on in in the breweries uh, when when they see that? Right, maybe the yeast straight from the the, the supplier. 
uh, takes a few generations to really, you know, hit its hit its uh, peak. Like, what's going on there with the yeast? Yeah, I, I think I mean that's too fast for it to be genetic. So it's almost certainly physiological. And um, you know, I don't, I'm always interested to see like the kind of like your yeast lightning, right? The new yeast nutrient that people add to things to kind of give their yeast a boost and, and get it, it going and what things they kind of run out of in wort that is, is low on. And so I think that transition from their um, media that they were in at the yeast supplier and then the shipping experience <laughs> uh, probably, you know, they, they have to you know, get started again and get used to the new conditions. And so that that's, um, we often will like pre-grow, even in lab, we'll, we'll do a, an overnight and then dilute back into the media we want. And that makes them behave much better even in the lab. So, you know, it, our lab, you know, we're not at a big fermenter scale, but <laughs> it's kind of the same idea that you get them physiologically adapted and then they're ready to go again if they're going back into the same conditions. But yeah, no, I, I think it's an interesting phenomenon there. And what matters? Yep. Like, what do they care about in terms of nutrients and what makes them happy and how do you treat them and stuff? So. Mm -hmm. That's a really good point about the shipping, though. Like, sometimes that can be a little rough on it. And, you know, we do our best to control it, but, you know, it is tricky sometimes. And, and yeah, some of these um, supplements out there, like nutrients that can kind of help ensure that the yeast has what it needs, right? Like, it's kind of this funny thing where really yeast doesn't need anything added except for maybe some zinc. Yeah. in work but you know sometimes it benefits from some of this added stuff uh and, and that can be on a strain to strain basis too right. and we're honestly still learning a lot of this stuff too about these these individual yeast strains especially as trends shift like suddenly sure. one yeast is the most popular one that every brewery is using but it wasn't a year ago so you know we're, we're doing our best to to catch up but sometimes it's a little bit tricky <laughs> craft beer moves so fast uh, this is a really interesting question, um, and I think we might close out with that. Can we use data from studies like these to better understand how historical yeasts Ooh. behave, especially when we don't have historical yeasts on hand? Yeah, so um, we actually used our family tree to try to extrapolate what the ancestor looks like. Um, because what you can do is you can tell, like, okay, most of the strains have, have this mutation and only a few of them have this mutation so probably this one's the ancestral one and you can go and do that over all the different mutations that have accumulated in all the different branches and assuming that you didn't miss anything really early that could have happened that can happen for sure that you can you can kind of figure out what that common ancestor looked like so um we've been able to to, to do that and um that's one reason why, um, you know, in, in the paper, you can read a little more detail about this, but um, a strain that was is kind of questionable, like, is the strain the ancestor of the Chico strains, or is it related to the ancestor? And, and you know, we, we found only a few hundred mutations, which is kind of a drop in the bucket different than for with this reconstructed ancestor than what we saw there. And so, you know, we're, I think we are able to make some extrapolations about what happened previously. And, and even with the big genome chunks, like, we can say, like, there's whole regions of genetic variation that are only present in some strains and been lost from others. And so if it got lost, then it must have been there if it is present in any of them. So, you know, you can kind of work your way back up and say, like, what must that um, older and older and older strain ha have looked like? Um, and, you know, one thing that makes it a little easier um, for the brewing strains is because they um, mostly are um, no longer going through meiosis and making germ cells and undergoing sexual cycles. And so they just grow and grow and grow. And so you don't have crosses that make figuring out that family tree really complicated. So there is stuff that happened early that causes a lot of um, differences in what region of the genome came from where and everything. But then after that, it's pretty much uh, just all cell division from there. Yeah, that's, yeah. A, that's an interesting idea. Oh, hi, Diego. Uh, thank you for coming. Uh, so uh, Diego is also going to send me some samples of some breweries that he's working with down in Argentina, which is very exciting. And um, he wants me to talk uh, to mention a conference that um, I'm actually a speaker at. So I don't mind uh, plugging it here, which is the International Workshop of Brewing Yeasts um, that's going to be in November. And he posted the link there. There's there's a lot of exciting uh, things going on, both practically and also some uh, science stuff like like what I talked about today. So take a look. Thanks yeah, really excited for that one. I'll be there. I'll be talking about Kvike yeast as well. So uh, it should be a really good conference. And 
you don't have to go to Argentina. Uh, you can attend it virtually. I think the the price is really, really reasonable too. So, you know, if you're interested in any of this brewing yeast genetics stuff um, or, or just yeast genetics in general, I think that's going to be a really good one. And Bariloche is where I mentioned that I met the that one expert that caused the collaboration where we figured that all out. So who knows uh, what can happen there. So. It's all full circle. <laughs> That's awesome. Uh, thank you so much for uh, for the presentation and, and taking time out of your day to come and speak with us. Uh, really appreciate it. Um, for everyone who's here, we're going to post this uh, webinar on our YouTube. Um, make sure you also go and check out that paper. I think it's uh, it's really, really cool. And uh, you know, we're going to try to have more of these kinds of things where we're bringing on people uh, to talk about their science. Uh, we're going to try out a few different other formats of sharing content this fall as well, so keep an eye open for that. Uh, but you know, just continue, really excited to keep this conversation moving and you know share what's exciting in brewing science um, and you know do everything we can to to support some of these uh, scientists doing what they're doing, and ultimately it ends up you know giving you guys more information and more cool yeast that you can use to make delicious. Beers. Uh, so thanks. Uh,